All right, this is The Earth and Its Peoples by Richard Bullitt, Chapter 19, The Atlantic System in Africa, 1550 to 1800. We're looking at Section 4, Africa, the Atlantic, and Islam. So uh, this chapter focuses much more on the impact that this Atlantic system had on Africa. And one thing to note is that Africa is a diverse place. That is to say, the Atlantic system didn't have one single uniform impact on Africa, uh, but had different impacts depending on which particular geographic region one is referring to. It is also to say that uh, Africa in this period from 1550 to 1800 was not only shaped by Atlantic trade, Atlantic trade played a big part of it, but also uh, shaped in part by Islam. Beginning with the Gold Coast and the Slave Coast, the Gold Coast and the Slave Coast refers to mostly West Africa. Uh, we have a pretty handy map here, uh, so maybe we'll do yellow to mark the Gold Coast. But essentially, the Gold, the Gold Coast and the Slave Coast is more or less this region right here uh, in, in Africa. And that's where most of, I would say probably most of the trade that took place with European, uh, with Europeans, uh, not all of it, but certainly most of it. In terms of the commodities, slave, slaves, gold, and ivory were exports. Europeans bought these. Oops. And in terms of imports, textiles and guns, right, imports. Uh, one thing that kept African kingdoms, uh, you might say, African kingdoms kept European traders on their toes was the fact that there were various European rivalries. And so African merchants and rulers could play Europeans against each other. Uh, it's also true that uh, sometimes Europeans gave kind of second thought to this trade because a lot of guns were going to the direction of these African kingdoms and could therefore make them more powerful. Uh, in West Africa, because there was a lot more, maybe not a lot more trade, but certainly lucrative trade uh, that was occurring along the Atlantic coast, you were much more likely to see various regional powers emerge. Uh, Dohemi, Oyo, and Asante. These were all African, uh, what we might call kingdoms, uh, you know, systems of tax collection, uh, armies, uh, bureaucracies, uh, certainly more formidable to any sort of outsider. And you can see a little bit of them here, at least, you know, here's Asante. Uh, actually, let's see, we can't really see that all that well. Uh, Asante is here on the Gold Coast. So put a little green check mark, mark next to it. Um, I don't see the other ones uh, right off the bat, but they might, may or may not be there. Um, these kingdoms, while they did engage in a lot of Atlantic trade, there was also a lot of overland trade. We call this the Trans-Saharan trade. And this was most likely to occur via the camel. And uh, the Trans-Saharan trade had gone on for a much longer time than uh, before Europeans arrived, especially uh, the Portuguese. So trade routes would typically go across the Sahara Desert. Uh, Timbuktu right here was a major trading point, and those commodities could then be brought into the various parts of Western Africa. So uh, the transatlantic slave trade was very lucrative, but also much older connections across the Sahara Desert continued to exist uh, into the 1800s. Now, most slaves who were traded to European merchants, especially in Western Africa, were POW or prisoners of war. They were caught on the battlefield. There is little evidence to suggest that war was motivated by capturing slaves. Rather, the capture of POWs was a result of other conflicts that occurred in the region. And because there were various uh, powers there, and because there were guns, uh, it was typically the more stronger and powerful kingdoms 
who could conquer less powerful kingdoms, take their uh, soldiers as POWs, and then sell them to European merchants. Uh, so the Gold Coast or the Slave Coast is likely the area that has the maybe most intense economic activity, but it is by no means the only area. In fact, when looking at the slave trade as a whole, it's actually other areas in uh, Central and, and maybe even Southwestern Africa that play a big role. The Bight of Bafra and Angola, you can't really see it in this map, but if we were to continue to extend Africa further south, Right, let's go ahead and extend Africa further south here. Um, Angola might be located in like this region right here. Uh, the Bight of Bafra is uh, kind of in this region right here, right, this central region. And a lot of slaves from this particular region uh, ended up going to the, uh, to the West Indies here, sugar colonies. And many from Angola went to Brazil, straight to Brazil, not even to the West Indies, especially on Portuguese, uh, Portuguese ships. Uh, the slaves which were traded in these two areas uh, were a little bit different. So as opposed to uh, regional powers and kingdoms uh, in this area of Bifra, there are much less in terms of kingdoms, mostly regional merchants. Uh, there might be something like uh, you know, a, a fair or market Uh, by merchants. Uh, slaves there also tended to be maybe less likely from prisoners of war, although that was the case. But these merchants were mostly in the business of selling debtors, right? So if somebody owed a debt they hadn't paid off, a merchant might sell that person into slavery to make good on their debt, or they might take their children as slaves and then you know sell them or family members. Uh, criminals, and uh, even possibly kidnappings, uh, and so less in terms of the POWs. In Angola, uh, this was one of the very rare areas in which Europeans made inroads to conquer land. So Portugal conquered territory uh, in Angola. And of course, like we said before, um, many of those slaves were then taken to Brazil to work on sugar plantations. Whereas when you look at the rest of Africa, uh, although, yes, Europeans had trading posts along the coast, for most of Western Africa, Europeans were held back. Uh, they were not able to make any type of inroads into the, uh, into the African continent. So there just might be you know, various trading cities all along here, but no sort of serious inroads, whereas in Angola, that was a little bit different. There's also one other area in which Europeans colonized uh, Africa before 1800, and that was the Dutch at Cape Colony, which is South Africa. But really before 1800, Europeans didn't really make any inroads into the interior of Africa. Uh, in Angola, you had a large number of people who were sold into slavery that were refugees. Uh, things like drought uh, pushed refugees to the coast to seek water sources and a better way of living. Sometimes these refugees were taken advantage of from local rulers, taken advantage from from the Portuguese, and simply just sold into slavery. Now, the impact of the slave trade on Africa, you know, you can't underestimate it. It certainly is a significant development in world history. In terms of the overall population of Africa, it seems that Africa still was able to maintain a steady population during the centuries and the acceleration of the Atlantic slave trade. Um, but we also have to state that it wasn't only the contact from Europe and the contact from uh, you know, the Atlantic world that shaped Africa, but also the continued Islamic contacts. Uh, the Islamic world was at this point by the 1500s stretched all the way from North Africa to Indonesia. Uh, Islam was founded, you know, we'll just say around the 700 CE and really flourished and continued to spread uh, all the way up until the time period that we're referring to. And Islam was introduced to Africa much, much earlier than Christianity was, especially the Portuguese who had arrived on the, at least West Africa, I should say, uh, the Portuguese who arrived on the West coast of Africa. So the Sahara trade was the trade across Sahara Desert. 
and it brought Islam to Western Africa. So if we go back up on this map, the Sahara trade is this trade that we outlined earlier in orange, where by camel, people, you know, for a very long time had been making their way across the Sahara Desert and trading goods and spreading ideas and spreading religion into this particular region here. Those connections continued during the 1500s and up through the 1800s. One of the states that was active in facilitating goods across the Trans-Saharan trade was the Ottoman Empire. This was an Islamic kingdom slash empire. We'll talk more about the Ottoman Empire in, um, in the next chapter, but they brought things like guns. This is not a European empire. And the city-states on East Africa's coast, the Swahili. Swahili is a word we've come across before. Uh, it is a language between Arab and African language. And uh, these were city-states in East Africa. And they could sometimes facilitate uh, trade as well. Uh, so when it came to uh, Islam in Africa, uh, for the most part, and this is reflective in Swahili, but other places as well, it was mostly an urban religion. It was a religion of the merchants, a religion of the rulers, uh, but most of the pop or, you know, a considerable part of the population retained an indigenous religion to Africa, uh, animistic religion, although there were certainly Islamic elements. Probably the most significant Islamic empire in Africa was the Songhai. They occupied uh, West Africa. They were the latest, you might say, in a series of West African empires that stretched back to the 800s, the Ghana, the Mali, and lastly, the Songhai. You can see the Songhai outlined here in the orange. However, the Songhai Empire met their demise when raiders from northern Africa, from Morocco, with firearms and guns, uh, conquered and brought an end to Songhai. And really, this was an important historical moment because with the introduction of firearms, there was a significant sort of all, uh, a significant change in the way that politics played out in Western Africa for nearly 600 years, uh, maybe even longer, 800 years, up until the 1500s, 1600s or so, very large, powerful empires existed in Western Africa, from Ghana to Mali to Songhai. But weapons and firearms made the difference. And once Songhai was defeated by raiders from Morocco, uh, Western Africa was no longer characterized by very strong and powerful empires, but rather a fragmentation of various kingdoms, constantly at war with one another, constantly rivaling with one another, and selling POWs as slaves to European merchants. Uh, we might mention just a couple other things about Africa, uh, Hausa and Bornu. These are more of Central Africa, who traded overland with Muslim merchants. So for the most part, these kingdoms in the central Sudan region, so we might be referring to uh, you know, this area right over here. And again, white doesn't show up too well on the map, but we'll be referring, referring sort of like into this region right here. Um, and then you can see the kingdom right here. Uh, these areas never really traded with Europeans directly. They traded across the Sahara Desert, mostly with Muslim merchants, but could access uh, European trade goods. So uh, things that had been passed off from Europe could make their way to these central kingdoms, not by direct European contact, but rather by uh, overland trade. One item that you didn't see in these central kingdoms was alcohol, as that, that was uh, prohibited uh, by the Islamic religion, but a lot of other European items also made their way there. Uh, this trade with the Islamic world included all commodities, including the Islamic slave trade. So slaves were traded across the Sahara des Desert in the Islamic world. There are a couple of key differences, though, with the Islamic slave trade and the European slave trade. One is that it was, we might say, uh, smaller in scale. Uh, just the sheer numbers, there were far more slaves traded to the Atlantic world than in the Islamic world. Uh, the types of slaves were a little bit different. They tended to be more uh, 
women sold as slaves. And rather than performing physical labor like most slaves did in the Atlantic world, uh, slaves in the Islamic world were much more likely to be servants. 